morning to everyone. I apologize for the time we have taken to start. We have had some technical difficulties that we are addressing. Welcome to the eighth uh, meeting of this online course, Venezuela in Struggles, Colony Past, uh, Revolutionary Legacy and Community Regeneration, which is a course which is focused on the struggle classes uh, from the perspective of the protagonist. This is a course that is uh, told by the main actors and militants of the communes, of the social movements, grassroots, activists, intellectuals, who are the protagonist of this course. It started in 2020 and it will finish next year. Today we are holding the eighth uh, course. We will have in total 24 courses. The idea is that in 2021 we will have uh, finished a phase, uh, a first phase centered on the communes. We started with uh, Reynaldo Iturriza, who told us about the revolutionary process, how was the onset of uh, the revolution and how Chavismo was built as uh, a political subject, as, a, as an alternative. And later we started dialoguing or our dialogue with uh, different actors. In the second meeting, we had to the participation of the El Maizal commune from the eastern part of our country and the Che Guevara commune from the Merida state. And then we uh, talked with uh, the Simon Bolivar commune from the Apure state, which is promoted by the revolutionary current Bolivar Isamora. And then also we had the opportunity to exchange with some urban communities such as the Pobladores movement and the Alto de Lidice Commune. We had the opportunity to exchange as well with the communes from the Anzuatec state. We played a documentary then that uh, we played in our meeting with the experiences uh, of uh, Venezuela, the communes, from Barcelona, Swatagi State, and we also exchanged with some Venezuelan movements as the Pobladores Movement, the Otro Beta Movement, another urban organization made up by young people who have been working together. <clears throat> and we also had a meeting to address the feminists agenda. We exchanged with different organizations from the feminine associations. And uh, the last session, we talked with the, or we exchanged on alternative communication, popular communication in Venezuela. So all along these courses, we have addressed the communal organization in Venezuela, the grassroots organization in the cities and in the inner cities. And uh, we have had a perspective from the Eastern and Western side of our country. And uh, as I already said, we had the experience of the feminist groups, community groups, communication groups, and this has allowed us to have an overview of the different grassroots movement in Venezuela. And thanks to those meetings, we have a broader a view of the Venezuelan process. Today, we have a special meeting, an extraordinary meeting. It was not programmed in the original 
agenda, but we thought it was important to include it. And it is about uh, the democratic dispute on Venezuela. And uh, today we will have the opportunity to exchange with uh, two presentations, so to speak. The first one will be an explanation from the institutional perspective. And we will hear one of the main authorities of the electoral power in Venezuela, the electoral branch. In 1999 in Venezuela, we decided to create an electoral branch within the structure of the public branches. We have the, exec the judiciary, the executive, and we have uh, the legislative and the electoral power, the electoral branch. Today, we will talk with uh, one of the highest authorities of that electoral branch who will give us a perspective or an overall view of the electoral system in Venezuela. Since we are going to hold uh, our parliamentary elections on December the 6th, which is going to be the election number 26 that we will hold in Venezuela. And then the second part of our meeting is going to be devoted to an analysis, an analysis on on the electoral juncture to reflect upon the forthcoming elections. The forthcoming elections are a challenge for Venezuela and we will comment on what is at stake. So before we start, we start, I would like to give the floor to Jade Sipsue for her to make her comments, introductory comments, and then start today's agenda. Now, thank you, Hanan. When the Smila National Assembly elections are scheduled for 6th of December, with over 14,000 14, candidates from 107 political organizations running for 277 parliamentary seats for a five-year term that begins on 5th of January 2021. More than 20 million citizens will be able to cast their vote. This is once again a, legis a legalization of whether it can defend and continue the legacy of the Bolivar Revolution and Chavismo, which includes two main goals. The first one, to protect people's sovereignty over oil and land resources, and two, to construct people's communes. This implies a long struggle of transforming the monocultural and rentier economy into a productive and communal economy. On 9th October 2020, Venezuela National Constituent Assembly passed a controversial anti-blockade law. It has aroused controversy about privatization of national resources. Yet, some argue that it allows for the participation of the state and organized popular power. Meanwhile, apart from the ruling United Socialist Party, there are newly formed leftist parties, such as Popular Revolutionary Alternative. It implies a challenging question, how to overcome internal contradictions within the leftist parties and how to be in solidarity to counter the fascist attacks and sabotage and the ongoing waves of imperialist recolonization. In the following lectures, let us listen carefully to how Venezuela government and people work together to turn popular initiatives and proposals into legislation in this coming national elections. Thank you. Thank you, Daddy, for those introductory remarks. I 
And in order to complete what Jade has said, I would like to explain to you the electoral process in Venezuela. The last South-South Forum on Sustainability that was held in 2019 dismantled the thesis that in Venezuela, the Bolivarian Revolution had not been working towards communal socialism. And I would like to tell you a couple of things, a couple of ideas to start today's session. The first is that some intellectuals from our continent said that Hugo Chavez was not only the father of the socialism of 21st century, but he was also the father of the democracy of the 21st century. This is just to tell you the importance that democracy has had in uh, the Venezuelan revolution. And another idea that I want to tell you about another thought is that in Venezuela, democracy has been a struggle led by the people. It has been a conquest. It has to do with uh, the possibility of leading a struggle. Just as we see in Bolivia, what happened last year that was a coup d'etat that did not recognize the results of the elections. And after one year of mobilization, they had new elections and the factic power did not recognize the results. And um, then in 2020, they have conducted new elections in order to go back to the democratic path in Bolivia. This has been a little bit what has happened in Venezuela. Each electoral process has been a struggle against the United States who do not give any type of credit to our elections. So it is important that we include in this seminar the electoral aspect. And there have been three elements that have been very important recently in terms of the electoral democratization understood as a dispute for democracy. First, we have the democratization and the citizenship in our people. In Venezuela, 20 years ago, the vast majority of the population, mainly the poor populations in the inner cities, did not have right to the citizenship. Many of them did not have an ID. Their citizenship had not been recognized by the state. And that was one of the important elements that we changed over the last years. The possibility that for many Venezuelans, many more Venezuelans to have an ID, to have a, a clear citizenship. In 1999, in the electoral process, we had registered over 11 million citizens. And after the process of democratization of our population in 2004, we added 3 million more new citizens. At that time, we had 22 million inhabitants. It was very important then for us to add all the people who have been excluded that did not have any kind of citizenship. And another important element in the democratization was also the democratization of the polling stations. In 1999, in order to allow people living far, in far distant cities, in far distant villages, 
it was difficult for them to go and vote, cast their vote. It was easier for people living nearby the polling stations. So what happened was that the polling stations were mainly located in the cities, in the big cities, in the middle class populations cities. It was an electoral process that was targeted towards only the high social classes and the people were excluded systematically. And a third element is the democratization of the electoral system. Until 2004, we had manual voting, such as the ones that exist in Colombia and other countries, with, which has many weaknesses. It is difficult to audit. It's an electoral process that does not provide guarantees for uh, the people to cast their vote. So these three elements, democratization of the citizenship and the polling stations and the updating of a direct electoral systems are going to be the topics that Professor Tania Namelo is going to explain to us. She is the director, is one of the director, one of the five directors of the National Electoral Council. And she's going to explain the electoral system to us. And she will explain in detail the legal aspects, political and technical aspects. So we will now play the video that she has sent us. And uh, this video will provide you pieces of information you, if you want, you can share your questions at the end, and then we will reflect upon this topic. Carlos Ron, who is the president of uh, the Bolivarian Institute, is going to share with us at the end of the meeting. So let's, let's watch the video. Good morning and good evening for those of you who are on the other side. Blessings to all. I am looking forward to this opportunity to exchanging with you and explaining to you what we have learned over these years. It is an honor for me to be here and this uh, blessed place to exchange on our electoral branch. And uh, since we are going to hold very important elections in Venezuela, I would like to congratulate and to thank you for this uh, opportunity. I have had the opportunity to exchange with some of uh, our partners on the Simon Bolivar Institute for Peace and Solidarity Among the Peoples. This is a space for exchange of views, exchange of lessons learned, and in that regard, I would like to congratulate Carlos Ron, Vice President, Vice Minister of uh, North America, who is uh, undertaking this big effort. And uh, it is indeed a very good effort because uh, exchanging will learn and it is important for all of us and all of our citizens. And even though it's late in your side, following this exchange, I think it's going to be very productive. I would like to start explaining the onset of this electoral branch, how it was created. And I think we need to understand this. 
so people can feel what we feel about our electoral branch. We feel very proud of having an electoral branch that was approved by Venezuelans in 1999. And why do I say this? I say this because uh, the Venezuelan people that participated in the consultation referendum held in 1999 in December approved the constitution of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And when they said yes to the constitution, they said yes to the creation of this new electoral branch. And when I say the new electoral branch, it is because in that consultation, we asked the people if they wanted a new branch to be created. And in 1999, the branch was called the Supreme Electoral Branch and was uh, under the authority of the, ex the executive branch. And when the people approved our constitution, when they approved the constitution, they said, yes, we want a new electoral branch that would not depend on the executive. And uh, we now have five powers, the judiciary, the executive, the legislative, the citizen branch, and the electoral branch. And it is an honor for me to tell you about this electoral branch today. And I wanted to share with you something that is very important as well, that is enshrined in the constitution of our country that was approved by the Venezuelan, by the majority of Venezuelans. I can proudly say today that this constitution is a tool for many countries and it has been comprised in many legislative visions of other countries. And it is an honor, it is an honor for us that our constitution is an example in the world. And I would like to share with you something very important. Our constitution has a explanatory memorandum. And some of you may wonder, what is this explanatory memorandum. It is an introduction. It is the reason why those who presented the proposal of uh, the constitution, the framers, why the people approved this proposal that was presented to them by the framers and where this branch came from and what was the spirit of the lawmaker and to give a new form to the electoral branch. And I would like to share with you the following. As an expression of the qualitative leap of the transfer from the de representative democracy to a protagonist and participatory democracy. The constitution, in order to create the electoral branch, establishes that we were to make a qualitative leap and a transference from the representative democracy to a participatory and protagonistic democracy and thereby creates a new branch of the public power, the electoral branch. It is then in this, uh, it is there in the explanatory memorandum that we consolidated the creation of the electoral branch led by the National Electoral Council, which is made up by five directors. And the electoral branch is the whole body. In other words, the national teams the regional teams in each one of the states whose purpose is to regulate the foundations, 
the systems and mechanisms guaranteeing the arrival of the new democratic objective. And there is something very important in the Constitution, a new culture based on citizens' participation. And I would like to clarify the following aspect. When the Venezuelan people approved this constitution, this new change was precisely what the memorandum, the explanatory memorandum was establishing. In other words, a new culture in terms of electoral processes. The electoral branch will no longer, or the electoral center will no longer be a representative institution and will become what it is today. In other words, an institution, a democratic institution, participatory and democratic institution. And this is why it is said in the constitution that uh, we will have a new cultural vision, a participatory vision that we will explain later on. In other words, more participation for voters to participate in the electoral role in elections, in the polls, a call made to the Venezuelan people to participate in the electoral process and the building of new elect, uh, polling centers and a new electoral culture. And we will explain all this later in our explanation. More participation of Venezuelans so that uh, the past institution, which was a closed institution, was to be a new institution open to the people, building alongside the people what we call today the participatory democracy, that Venezuelans will interact to build what we have today in our electoral system. So when we talk about uh, the electoral branch, we have the Constitution of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And luckily, after adopting this Constitution, it uh, enables us to approve new norms and regulations of our uh, electoral processes. For instance, the constitution of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And uh, I would like to mention Article two of the constitution. It says Venezuela constitutes itself as a democratic and social state of law and justice. When we say this, which is enshrined in the constitution and approved by the Venezuelan people, this means this, this is a democratic and social state of law and justice. that means that we need to defend our processes. Processes linked to our democracy, election, and participatory mechanisms. And in Article 3 of the Constitution, it says, the essential purposes of the state as the protection and the democratic exercise of the will of the people to protect the exercise, the democratic exercise of the will of the people. It is a right. Venezuelans pass. And the electoral branch has to respect the democratic exercise of the will of the people. I insist on this because our constitution 
has to guarantee the will of the people. For instance, what happened in 2015 in the elections of the National Assembly. In that case, the opposition obtained the majority of the seats of the National Assembly and the other political bloc of lawmakers of the, the government party, they obtained the minority. However, the electoral branch, respecting the will of the people, sworn in and gave the credentials to each one of the deputies uh, elected uh, on that occasion. And over the last years, we have had uh, gubernatorial and majoral elections. And there we have had governors from the opposition elected and uh, other candidates uh, of the government party also won, and they, all of them were equally recognized as the winners because it is the Venezuelan people in Venezuela are they are they the ones they are the ones who decide. So in this Article Three, this is clearly enshrined. Article Five that they would like to share. I wanted to share some of the articles with you. And uh, thanks God, our the constitution is published in various languages. Therefore, people can read it uh, in their own language. So Article 5, it reads, Sovereignty resides and transferable in the people who exercise it directly in the manner provided for in this constitution. Again, here we stress the idea that the sovereignty resides and transferably in the people. When we say that the sovereignty resides and transferably in the people, we mean something very important, namely to respect the decision of the Venezuelan people. We believe that it is important for the world to know that we need to respect the decisions of the people and that respect is characterized in our constitution. It's not lip service. It's not that's the narrative. It is a norm enshrined in the Constitution and such it should be abided for. So, and it is important at all levels, at the organs of the power. The electoral branch should respect this, but also it should be respected in the decision made at the, the in the communities, in the communal councils. Those decisions made by the people in the communities, in the, ele in the various electoral processes, all those decisions are clear decisions, expressed decisions that should be respected by the, the competent bodies. When we talk about competent bodies, we refer to the constituted branches of power. The electoral power, the electoral branch, for instance, but they have to obey the will of the Venezuelan people. What we have built so far has been thanks to the electorate. So when we say, in this article five that uh, an indirectly 
by stockbridge, we say that uh, Venezuelans through suffrage, they are the ones who decide the path, the fate of the country, of the community. So, and wherever they are. So when we talk about uh, the exercise of the vote, that's a right to all Venezuelans in other countries. As we say in Article 62 of the Constitution, it says all citizens have the right to participate freely in public affairs. Well, in Venezuela, the right to vote is not compulsory. And so I'd like to stress the following. In other countries, voters are fined and punished if they do not vote. In Venezuela, rather, in Venezuela, it is a right. It is not compulsory. However, when you see the process of participation, it's amazing. There is a high level of participation of the population in the election process, despite the fact that the vote is not compulsory. It means that Venezuelans are fully committed in decide the path, the future of their country, to decide what is going to happen in their own community. I've had the privilege of visiting other countries as an international electoral observer. And I've been able to see cases where you have a polling station that is closing at four o'clock and people running to get there on time. And then I say to the people, well, too bad that you couldn't, you couldn't vote. And some people tell me, no, I'll be punished. I'll be fine if I do not vote. I have to pay 10% of my salary. I'm not going to mention any country, of course. 10% of my salary will be taken by the state as a fine because I haven't voted. Well, luckily in Venezuela, we do not have to punish and to threaten the Venezuelan to vote. Here, People are very happy to vote. They take the initiative, they want to participate, they want to decide, and they're very thrilled in voting. And we need to stress this. Venezuelans vote because they want. They want to participate. Article 70 of the Constitution says that their means of participation of the people, the exercise of the sovereignty. Article 70 reads and enshrines the processes of consultation, various types of consultations. When I mention consultations is because I want to stress the following. It reads, participation and involvement of people in the exercise of their sovereignty in political affairs can be manifested by voting to fill public offices, referendum, consultation of public opinion, mandate, revocation, legislative, constitutional and constituent initiative, and so on. When I mention this article is because it says the constitutional and constituent initiative and i'd like to take this opportunity because it 
this is not the topic of this seminar, but I would like to re mention the constituting assembly because some people said that it was not constitutional, that it was not a means of participation, that it was not um, validity, and uh, it was not enshrined in the constitution. But that is not true because in this constitution, approved by a majority of Venezuelans, in this Article 70, you can clearly read that the constituent initiatives is a constitutional tool and our public consultation methods are also constitutional. And when I mention popular uh, consultation, uh, I mean that for instance, we had the opportunity as electoral branch to accompany the people in popular consultation in three states of the republic in these three states with the people's power we were able through this article 70 organize the important uh, networking and connection between the, the national electoral uh, the, the electoral uh, branch and the people's power in our uh, democratic and participatory processes we need to refer to our uh, legislative uh, or judiciary system. I do not know if in the world this is like this, but this electoral branch, thanks to this new constitution, we have the power to legislate in the fields related to our electoral branch. Why do I want to mention this? The electoral branch has been able to frame regulations, draft regulations for the coming elections of December the 6th. Some people wonder how come the National Electoral Council could approve the contain norms and regulations. The CNE approved regulations for uh, the elections of the La As National Assembly. So they wonder how come that the National Electoral Council can approve uh, the laws and regulations. It is true that uh, in many countries, these laws and regulations are approved by the National Assembly. But according to our constitution, the electoral branch can approve regulations for elections. In this case, the changes that occurred in the constitutional uh, uh, whole or chamber, uh, they made uh, changes that allowed us to adopt these regulations. When we talk about uh, the judiciary and the constitution of the Republic and our legislations, our norms, what we are uh, uh, able to do according to the constitution. All of this means that all the actions taken within this uh, electoral branch, uh, all of that is characterized in the constitution. In the constitution, we find uh, all the duties and uh, the powers of this electoral branch. So, our norms and regulations are all of them enshrined in our constitution. In Article 293 of the Bolivarian Constitution, it reads that the electoral branch can conduct electoral processes and the legislative um, branch has to be renewed, renew the mandate of the lawmakers. 
if I mention this article, is because there are some people and some countries they have uh, said to Venezuela that how come you need to organize those elections right now? That the circumstances are not uh, uh, good for these elections, that we need to change the date. So far, we have been mentioning the constitution and the, the legal framework. In our constitution, in Article 293, it reads that the legislative branch should be renewed every five hours. Therefore, it is our duty, it is our power based on the electoral timetable that we need to renew the National Assembly. It is not a whim, it is not, it is not a caprice, it is not a groundless decision. This decision is taken based on the Constitution approved by the Venezuelan people. And this Constitution states that the, the deputies should be elected every five years. That is why on January the 20, 21st, a new National Assembly should be sworn in. That is why, in the name of God, in the coming December, there will be elections to elect new deputies to the National Assembly. And that is why these elections have been the, uh, called for. We need also to clarify that the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court of Justice in a draft resolution of the justices in the ruling 0070, they appointed the new uh, directors, principal and uh, uh, secondary members of uh, this uh, National Electoral Council. How come it was the Supreme Court that appointed these directors of the National Electoral Council? Well, let me tell you this. It has been said repeatedly, and uh, there have been various debates in some places where they have disagreed on calling for this uh, election. And uh, they have said, and they have distorted this decision. And they are saying that the, the Supreme Court cannot appoint the director of the National Electoral Council. Well, let me tell you this. The National Electoral Council that organized the last elections in 2015 to elect deputies of the National Elect Assembly were precisely elected by, appointed by the Supreme Court. The, I'm talking about the election in 2015 where the opposition won uh, the majority of the National Ex uh, Assembly. Well, those elections were organized by the directors appointed precisely by the Supreme Court of Justice. So it is a very curious that all of a sudden, in this occasion, that is not appropriate, but in 2015, it was appropriate. Why? Why the Supreme Court has to appoint these uh, directors? If it is true that the National Assembly has the duty to appoint the new members of the National Electoral Council, the Constitution state that if the National Assembly, due to omission, legal omission, they do not appoint these new directors, then the, another body, another organ approved by the Constitution should then appoint these directors. Therefore, because of omission of the legislative branch, the uh, Supreme Court had Point the new National Electoral Council. And it is why this Electoral Council was, uh, um, was uh, appointed. 
and uh, in 2015, I had the honor of being part of the board of directors of the National Electoral Council. The, therefore, I know pretty well what I'm what I'm talking about because I was the I was part of that uh, council when the elections were held in um, in to elect the new National Assembly. So we can uh, now say the following. We said that according to our constitution, we are able to approve norms and regulations for the elections. Currently, we have the organic law of the electoral branch. And I'd like to mention Article 2 of this. Uh, of the organic law of the electoral branch. It reads, the electoral branch as a guarantor of uh, uh, the power pu publics that, uh, that have to preserve the will of the power expressed through the to say that uh, not only we have the Bolivarian Republic, the Constitution of the Bolivarian Republic, we also have norms that govern the functioning of the electoral branch, uh, the electoral uh, processes, law, the other norms and regulations, the political parties, law, public manifestations of will, etc. So when we le read the legal framework, we could say that our electoral process or system. Our electoral system is a electoral system of direct election and simple majority. In Venezuela, we choose our candidates in a direct manner and for a simple majority. And uh, it is just a one turn election, a primary election, because uh, in Venezuela, fortunately, and I'd like to comment on this in Venezuela, the upcoming election is num election number 25. And uh, over the last two decades, we have had 25 elections with the forthcoming election. But these have been 25 national elections. In Venezuela, we have conducted Elections for a municipality, for three municipalities, for the constituent assembly, we had to repeat also some elections and some polling stations because there were vandalism and riots. And after the, con the election of the constituent assembly, we had to repeat elections in two municipalities as well. And sometimes we do not uh, incorporate those uh, elections, the ones that we repeat in the final counting. But if we count all elections, the municipalities elections, we will have 31 elections. 31 elections is a very important number in 20 years. 31 elections in 20 years. And why do I say this? When I was explaining to you how our electoral system works, imagine if we had to conduct two rounds elections. It will be madness because we will have the double of the number of elections. So we have only one election, not two rounds elections, one single election. And this demonstrates our strengths 
our trust in the Venezuelan system, the Venezuelan electoral system. Venezuelans are used to choosing their presidents in a direct manner. The president is elected through direct vote. We don't have the second wave elections to choose any candidates, nor the presidents or governors or mayors. We choose, we elect our governors through direct suffrage. And of course, we guarantee the principles of personalization of suffrage and proportional representation for the candidates that are participating in a given election. In 2019, and at the final of the end of 2018, we have been assessing the obsolescence of the machine votes that we use in those electoral processes. And by this, I want to highlight the following. We are very proud of our electoral system because we are using new machine votes. But uh, our electoral processes have all been automated processes. And we have made important efforts to update the machines, to perfect the machines and to automate, automate all the electoral processes. Uh, I think you are aware of the fact that uh, Last year, 95% of our machines were destroyed because of vandalism, terrorist attack. And uh, you can imagine the repercussions of that uh, act. We were always preparing uh, to update our machines, but we never expected that violent actions. And they thought that by burning the machines, because there was arson that was committed, they thought just because they had put on fire all those machines that we would not have any kind of machines for forthcoming elections. But, well, this was not the case because Venezuelans have been designing new machines and Venezuela has a lot of ex expertise in the electoral branch and they were prepared for future needs and they were aware of the importance of strengthening the new machines and so this is the reason why we can present to the world to our country our new machines and on December the 6th we will have these new machines and this is very important why because this technology that we use has been perfecting itself over time and we can see how our people accept this technology we have also conducted several drills we have conducted two drills up to now. Well, everyone has been testing the machines and they are happy with them. We have a bigger screen. Before we had a small uh, or, or an electronic uh, screen, but now it is easier to use the screen. Now, thanks to those uh, tactile screens, our elect voters can choose their candidate in an easier manner, which is different what happens in other countries like Brazil. Brazil, for instance, they have a, a machine. They also have automated elections, but they do not have the paper trail, which we have. 
what do we have? We have, for instance, the possibility to choose your candidate on the screen and then the machine will issue a paper, paper ballot, a paper trail, and then you can look at your paper and see and check, verify if the machine has registered the candidate that you have voted for. This is very important. And another thing is that we use our authentication voter system. What does it mean? Well, it means that you will only have one vote, one uh, voter, one vote per voter, because the only way in which you can activate that machine is through your digital print. All the digital prints are registered in that system. So, it is impossible for a different person to vote on behalf of, a, of a, any other voter. So this is the, the reason why we say that we have one voter, one vote. In some places, you can hear comments, you know, that are not adjusted to reality and uh, I would also like to say that we are, every two months, we are decorating our electoral roll. We conduct a series of operations in order to carry out different processes, such as the civil registry process. And we have the uh, different acts of uh, our Venezuelans or of Venezuelans who have passed away. We know how many of them have passed away and they are extracted from the electoral roll. And this is something new of our electoral branch. The electoral power has the responsibility of updating the electoral roll. I would also like to say that this timetable that is available for everyone. And you can also check on our website and have a look at it. In the different processes that we have conducted, we have provided many guarantees. And uh, in this timetable, all Venezuelans can follow up with the different activities of our National Electoral Council. But anyone in the world can visit our website and can visit the electoral timetable and they can follow what activities we are conducting on real time. The electoral branch visualizes, vi makes visible to everyone, to every Venezuelan and to everyone outside Venezuela to follow up what we are doing. And this is important to mention. The electoral timetable is another guarantee of our electoral process. Another guarantee that we provide, and this has been acknowledged in the world because we have the visits of uh, international uh, observers these observers, they always say, why do you conduct so many audits in Venezuela? We are surprised by the number of audits that you have for each process, electoral process, because you conduct audits for everything, for the machines, for the software, for the lists. And I, answer to them. Of course, we start our audit, audits when we start the elections. The first audit that we conduct is to the register role. But in that audit, you have the participation of political parties. Because the audit is not conducted only for the CNE, Team. No, we make audits 
with all the political parties that participate in the elections. And all the members of all political powers, uh, political parties can ask questions, can ask for clarifications. And, and the audits that were conducted for the forthcoming elections took more than nine days because it was a new software. And all political parties were there asking questions, they were using the machines, they were practicing. And in our web website, we have all the minutes that have been signed by the members of the political parties and by the team that is conducting these tasks. And so far, we have had no, no irregularities, no claims. Why do I say this? I say that we do not only have, I mean, all the audits that we do, we do them with the political parties. Everyone, every, and each audit has the presence or is done with the presence of the political parties. And we conduct audits before the elections, but on the election day, we also conduct audits that one audit that is called the citizen's verification. And what is this citizen verification about? I would like to share this information with you because I'm so proud of this. In an election, you have the witnesses from the political parties, you have the electoral staff or the members of the polling stations that are, that are draw and in Venezuela, every voter that is not a, over 70 years old or, or that has not a condition, physical condition, and cannot participate as an electron, an electron worker can be chosen to be an electoral worker. And there is a distinction. You have the witnesses who just are appointed by the political parties to oversee the process, but the electoral workers are chosen randomly. So in the day, on the election day, there is a draw of 52% of the polling stations. How do you do this? You use the count and report, and you verify how many votes obtain each candidate. And how does the audit take place? They open the ballot box and they compare it with the counting report. And you do this with 52% of the ballot boxes. And this is what we have been doing in all of our elections. If there is an irregularity, and it has never been the case so far, because some have said that elections had been rigged, but it has never been proven. Why do I say this? Because if there is some kind of piece of evidence or any claim that you have at the moment of the election, you have to inform it. And so far, out of the 24 elections and the 25th election that we will hold on the December the 6th, I'm sure that so far we have not had one single complaint one single we have had not one single complaint with pieces of evidence claiming that in there has been any kind of irregularity this audit is conducted on the election day and so far we have had no any irregularity when you choose your candidate on the screen on the machine roll you will receive from the machine a paper trail and you can verify in your paper trail if the candidate that you have selected is the right one. There has never been any kind of discrepancy between the election made on the screen and the candidate shown in the paper trail. And why do I insist on this? It is because transparency of our process is the number one value, is the vision that we have as an institution because we want our process to be 
transparent, reliable. And this is the reason why all the political parties as attend to all the audits that we conduct even on the election day. And once the process has uh, been finished, we still have other audits with the participation of political parties. One of the audits that we conduct after the election day is that we verify our digital prints. If there has been irregularity, for instance, they can verify after the election day, they verify all the process from scratch and the audits that they have conducted in all the states. They take a sample and uh, they verify. Good question. The audit for us is a fundamental element for the reliability and transparency of our electoral process. And now with the pandemic. With the pandemic, we have designed, we have included in our website a link where international observers can follow all these audits that have, I have described in real time. Those organizations that were not present can follow live all the audits. They have been able to participate and to accompany the process. We have had some international observers. We have had observers from Russia, from Argentina, and from other countries who have been able to verify our auditing processes. We recently had the visit of the international observers from CELA who were present in one audit and some others who have been able to follow the whole process through our digital platform. We also approved regulations so that uh, that observer who is following our activities through our platform, through our app, can also comment, make comments or ask questions. And even though the observer is not in, uh, attending the audit physically, they can make comments virtually in a virtual manner. So with the pandemic, of course, we have had to visualize all their processes and to adapt to the new circumstances so that all the international watchers can be there and to avoid overcrowding in the polling stations, guaranteeing that in each one of all our process, parts of our process, we can also guarantee the biosecurity measures. So we have been guaranteeing the biosecurity norms for all participants, including the representatives of the political parties. Our process has a schedule. We start at 7 a.m. in the morning, setting up the polling station, and then voters can cast their vote until 6 p.m. Provided that there are no voters in standing in line. If you have someone standing in line after 6 p.m., the electoral process carries on. In other countries, this is not the case. They close their polling stations at 4 p.m. sharp and they do not, do not allow more voters to cast their vote. But this is not the case in Venezuela. This is customary in Venezuela, and it has become a norm. If there are voters waiting to cast their vote, they cannot close the polling stations. 
our electoral process retain the 87 electoral districts that uh, uh, were running for the parliamentary elections in 2015. We also had 87 electoral districts in this election. We did no modifications, but what we did modify from the elections in 2017, there we were electing 177 deputies, but now we will be electing in the upcoming elections 277. There has been a high percentage, 60% more seats that are going to be elected in this parliamentary elections. We have 48 candidates for a national list. We have a regional list, 96 seats, and 130 individual seats for the parliamentary. And we will also have three seats for the indigenous populations, which will, I will comment in a while. We also need to stress that we have 14,221 polling stations. There is an important percentage of polling centers and this is the reason why many people can vote easily, can show up for, for the elections and vote with no problem. And this is another thing that I wanted to comment. We have facilitated access to the voting process because we have been creating those polling stations by the request of some communal councils, some communities that have uh, that have uh, said that in order to avoid overcrowding, they created new polling centers. This is the reason why the, today we have 14,221 polling stations, so that all voters can cast their vote. I would like to dwell upon an aspect that is very important for us. So far, I have been telling you that in the auditing process, we have the participation of political parties. And I always stress this point, and you have heard me say that they participate in all audits we conduct. And I think it is important to highlight this. In Venezuela, right now, we have 107 org political organizations that are going to participate in the upcoming elections. I don't know if you have had the opportunity to see what is happening in other countries where they only have two political parties participating in an election. In Venezuela, we have 107 organizations, 107 per po political parties, and also we have the participation of the indigenous candidates that are participating in the forthcoming elections. Everyone knows that uh, in Venezuela, we have agreed, we have uh, uh, concluded some agreements, political agreements, and um, in this manner, we are facilitating uh, the get the coexistence of Venezuelans, and it is important to highlight that uh, there are sectors of the opposition that decided to participate in the upcoming elections and they are participating in our elections. When I said that we had 107 political parties, I'm talking about the political parties from the opposition who have decided who are committed with the elections. The National Constituent Assembly, in its uh, objective of harmonizing uh, rules, they approved a decree in 2017.
the National Assembly back then reached an agreement and they decided to disapply that constituent decree where the political organizations did not renew their candidates. Since they did not renew their candidates, what were they doing? Well, our law says that if uh, they did not participate in that process, they had to be canceled. So in order to favor the understanding and the agreements that started in Venezuela in order to reach peace, they incorporated eight organizations, eight political parties, thanks to the decision they made in the Constituent National Assembly. Why? Because those other parties that were sanctioned because they were not abiding by the law, they were incorporated in this process so that they could also participate and had the right to, to nominate their candidates. So this is the reason why today we can say that in Venezuela, almost 90% of political organizations are committed with the elections, are committed with the electoral pathway. And I, I insist on this. Why? Because all around the world, they are claiming that the political parties from the position do not want to participate. And they have even published a, a document saying that 26 organizations, political organizations, are withdrawing from the process. But this is a lie. This is a fabrication made by a sector of the position that do not want to participate and are but today, more than 90% of the political parties are committed with the Venezuelans and are going to support the electoral pathway. We have 14,221 candidates. Just for, for a minute, think about this figure. This tells us about the democracy in our country. These are Venezuelans who have organized themselves in political parties, in indigenous parties, and they are committed with peace in Venezuela. They are committed with strengthening the participatory and protagonistic democracy that is enshrined in our constitution. So we have 14,221 candidates all around our territory who are leading their political campaigns. So this tells the whole world that in Venezuela, right now, Venezuelans fully trust this electoral national council. And why do I insist on this? Because if that were the case, these organizations had not enrolled themselves and had not nominated their candidates before the CNE so that they could participate in the upcoming election. So this National Electoral Council consolidated as an institution who is working for all Venezuelans has come out even stronger as days go by and until December the 6th. So on the election day, we will accomplish the first and most important task that we have from our electoral power, which is to guarantee P, guarantee the Venezuelan understanding, to guarantee the true participatory and protagonistic democracy. And, uh, as it is the case in other countries, yeah. we will have losers, we will have winners, but Venezuela is going to will because we say to the world that we are participating, we're defending our homeland. And how do we defend our homeland? Well, if we all cast our vote, if we are all registered for voting, if we are all participating on the campaign, why? To cast our vote, on December the 6th.
So this is very important, especially now, when many countries have uh, attempted to lie against our countries. I want to tell you, those who have tried to distort in the depiction of what is going on in Venezuela and how happy we are in Venezuela. And you are going to be impressed about the commitment of Venezuelans regarding their elections. In Venezuela, this is not just paying lip service. We have had 25 electoral processes. That is not a lie. That is something that you can touch, you can see. Those who have come to Venezuela, they have uh, been able to see what we have done over the years. We have uh, grown, we have uh, strengthened our democracy. Our people believe in the, the settlement of uh, differences through suffrage, through elections. In Venezuela, we have uh, 20 million 700,000 people that can vote. This voter list has been built with the communities. When we call the communities to register, and this is a permanent register, every single day you can register your name to vote, you can change your address to be able to vote, but it is clear that for every election, there is a moment when you have to stop the registry in order to use that final figure for the election. Presidential elections, for instance, Venezuelans who are abroad, they can vote. In this case, only foreigners living in Venezuela, living here for more than 10 years, they can vote in the legislative elections. Uh, then only those uh, foreigners who have lived in the country for 10 years who can live and vote in the coming election because these elections are per uh, jurisdiction and they deal with the separate jurisdiction. It is not a national vote. So, so today we have a gap of 3% of the people who have not registered in the voter list. And it has been difficult. But when we arrived and become directors of this electoral branch, in 1999, well, the gap was 23% of the population who were not registered in the voter list. They didn't register because uh, the uh, polling stations were too far away and people were not motivated to vote. They had concentrated uh, electoral uh, centers and people didn't go there. Today we have thousands of uh, polling stations where people can easily go and register and uh, be part of the voter list. That is why today the gap is very small, only 3% that they are not uh, registered. But uh, in 1992 Nine, 2000, the gap was 23% of the population who were not uh, registered to vote. And that amount has been uh, diminished because uh, this electoral branch has a new approach of uh, participation, inclusion, and it is with the people that we have worked and motivated them to register and to vote and to elect the uh, candidates and their rulers. 
So many countries have told us that this is not a good time to hold the elections because we have a pandemic, that it was dangerous. However, we need to stress that today, 91 electoral processes have been taking place during this pandemic. So you wonder how come they want us not to organize elections when around the world elections are conducted. And very recently, we saw elections that uh, were taken, uh, that took place in some countries and they have not been decided yet. But I want to stress that Venezuela is ready for the elections, that that claim that uh, there was a pandemic in Venezuela and elections cannot take place, and it's not true. Luckily, Venezuela, thanks to the action of the Venezuelan state, headed by Nicolas Maduro, well, and uh, as uh, director at Venezuelan, I need to pay tribute to our government because Contrary to other countries, Venezuela has been able to overcome the pandemic. Today, we have flattened the curve. Therefore, we are in a very good position to ensure the biosecurity during the elections to all Venezuelans. So, in closing, I'd like to say that uh, regarding biosecurity, the National Electoral Council has approved a biosecurity plan together with the Ministry of Health. It is indeed not easy because uh, the electoral branch was ready for elections, always technically, the workers, the staff were very much committed with the technical aspect of the elections. However, we didn't know that we had to include in this titanic task to include the biosecurity aspect. Now, let me tell you, and thanks God, we received the visit of uh, international organizations responsible for biosecurity and they have congratulated us on our progress because this since the beginning of the process with the electoral registry the audits the various meetings organized with the political organizations the drills, we have uh, had two drills. We have been able to ensure the biosecurity, the biosafety, the masks. We have uh, sat in, uh, sanitized the polling station in the horseshoe. It is uh, the horseshoe system where we have uh, the use of the mask, which is compulsory. Second, the use in the polling stations at the entry, we sanitize the elector, the voter. Then in the whole shoe, we sanitize before going to the machine. Once they have cast the vote, where they sign against, Again, we sanitize the pens and everything. So I can tell you very responsibly that all the voters who go to vote, they can be certain that we guarantee to voters, to center coordinators, to the armed forces, to all those who are going to vote, we can ensure their health because we've been working hand in hand with the Ministry of Health, the WHO, following all the protocols. Therefore, we can say 
that in the same manner that we have graduated in automating electoral processes, we can say today that we have graduated in all the biosafety protocols because we have conducted a number of tests where to sanitize how we should do it and so on and so forth. Therefore, we have, uh, we have a total command of the, the biosecurity measures. We have been able to update our web page and there you know where you have to vote and we have a, a very good motivational campaign to ensure health but also to tell people to update them where they should vote where they should uh, if they have been selected as the poll workers because uh, citizens should fulfill electoral service. Those who have been uh, um, selected as uh, poll workers, they have to attend. They have a phone number 2337 and there you can send a message and then you know where are you going to vote. Therefore, we have a very robust campaign through the networks, our web page. Those who do not know yet where to vote, no problem, you go to the web page and you can find out. Our networks are up and running and we keep on informing all the citizens, all electors, where to vote and where to go to do so. So also uh, there is a page where we ask people, do you want to know who the candidates are? Very good. You go to the web page and there you find the candidates. And then you see how's the screen, where are the various political organizations located on the screen, so you can easily find your candidate and your political party. In a nutshell, we have resorted to all technological tools because in the midst of this pandemic, our uh, initiatives have been strengthened to help people voter to know their candidates. We have the electoral fairs, 500 places in the whole country where people can go and test. Our voting machines are in the streets. Voters can see for themselves. They can see where the candidates are. They can touch the machine and be familiar with the machine. So this means that we are not only working through the web, we are also working in the streets, in the plazas, in public places, protected with their masks, their uh, sanitizing the area, but uh, always serving electors, voters, for those voters to get familiar with the way these machines, these new machines work. And this is very important. Very important for people to get familiar with the new machines. On December the 6th, the elections will be fully automated. All Venezuelans will vote, all voters will be there. But also indigenous people can vote on December the 6th. Why do I say this? Well, on December the 9th, we are going to hold elections exclusively for indigenous people only for them. Why? Well, there was a decision of the Supreme Court giving the Electoral Council the power to design the electoral process of the indigenous people based on the norms regarding each one of these processes. Well, when we 
organized indigenous elections with say the following. Indigenous peoples should vote for their own people. That was the spirit of the framers when they introduced this norm. So the community assemblies have been a major experience. They work with the original peoples. I would like to share with you another activity that we have in the Electoral Council is the electoral branch and the, the connection with the, the people's power. Regulations were approved in our branch to receive the citizens organization and we accompany the electoral processes within the communes and the communal councils. I've seen, I've said, uh, said this uh, uh, very often in the past, but uh, we are present in all the communities. There are more than uh, 40,000 uh, electoral councils in those communal councils. Why? In the construction of our uh, electoral role, we've been able to work with communal councils in order for them to invite people to register in the voter list. And through those electoral commissions of the communal councils, we work together in order to identify where polling stations should be built, polling centers should be created. Why? Because it is the people who know what they need. They know how voters have to go from one place to another to vote. It was a beautiful, wonderful experience. Last year, we have a popular consultation with electoral commissions, one in the Lara state, where the name of a parish was modified. And it was a wonderful experience because the electoral chamber uh, supported this community and there was a consultation among communal councils through the various electoral commissions where the people decided to change the name of that parish. In Miranda State, likewise, in December the 1st, well, we accompanied a permanent electoral commission in a commune in the Miranda state where they asked for charging some taxes in order to benefit the communal councils of that area in order to collect taxes to help in their various activities. So we could say that uh, over the last seven years, we've been able to support more than 5,000 electoral commissions in the whole country through uh, our regional offices. This has been a wonderful experience because it is not only to pay visit, but also to accompany them, to advise the electoral commissions of the communal councils, they play a major role. They preserve the update electoral list, how many people died, how many new citizens have born, and those that input, which are essential to our branch, because we are responsible of the elect of the uh, civil registry. So they give input for us to update the civil registry. They are therefore centerpiece in this process. Well, I would like to add that the electoral branch has been making a lot of progress 
although we still have a lot to do in order to help people with disabilities. We have pro uh, approved a guide in order to accompany people with disabilities. We have uh, a uh, guide that is placed in all polling stations. So people who are going to vote, they know how to assist people with disabilities. We have included the sign language. For instance, during the audit, if you are connected through our webpage, you can see always someone, an interpreter of sign language, translating all the process. However, we need to continue working with CONACRI, which is the body responsible for assistance to people with disability. We have uh, more than 180,000 people registered with the various disabilities in our uh, electoral registry. So we take into account those people to help them to vote in better conditions. Uh, people with uh, uh, body uh, disabilities, physical disability, they can vote uh, at the, uh, at the, um, in the first floor instead of uh, climbing stairs and so on and so forth. So those are the measures taken with to favor the vote of people with disabilities. In closing, we can tell you that uh, the system is very uh, simple, it's very easy. We have the horseshoe, which are, is very, um, very simple. We have biosecurity, the mask, the authentication, system in the first station, then people go to the machine, they select the candidate. They have the paper trail, this paper trail, so you can have, you can make your own audit to make sure that uh, it reflects your the decision, you put it in the box, and it is sanitized. Oh, at the end of the horseshoe, the pens and pencils are sanitized. It means that when you use the pencil to sign, that pencil or pen has been sanitized. So there is no danger whatsoever. So the electoral branch guarantees the biosecurity of the process to all voters. As you can see, this is the, the option that you find the machine is very easy. You choose your candidate, and there you see the party they belong to. To the right, you have uh, the candidates, the candidates in the list, and the candidates with their own names. So. At the end, you have the paper trail enabling you to check. It is a very new and very the novelty, but it's very easy and straightforward to vote. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Foreign Ministry for this kind invitation. Thank you so much for this possibility to global. University for Sustainability of the People's Republic of China, the Continental Platform of the, the ALBA Movement, the Simon Bolivar Institute, the Center uh, Development and Cultural Center, the Lingnan University of the People's Republic of China, the TV network of ALBA, the Re Regional Asian Exchange of Hong Kong, the Green Room, Center in China. Well, my uh, colleague has been helping me to record this uh, message. Thank you. Thank you to God and to Jesus Christ for this possibility. And thank you who have been listening to us. We hope that this has been useful. Venezuela, 
belongs to Jesus Christ. And on the 6th of December, there's going to be a reunification. We're going to have happiness because Venezuelans, we have we have to determine the future of our country. It is not others who do so. It is up to us to determine the future of our country. So thank you very much and many blessings, blessings to all of you. Well, thank you very much for uh, speech of Tanya Amelia, one of the directors of the National Electoral Council. As I said before, her presentation, the National Electoral Council is uh, the part of the electoral branch. This is an independent branch who oversees, which oversees the electoral processes. And she told us about the, about the 24 elections that we have conducted in Venezuela, how to support the elections to elect uh, the communes and uh, trade unions and all community organizations that require assistance from the electoral branch. So thanks again to Dania who explained to us in detail the electoral process in Venezuela. So let's check board questions of the audience. From India, someone asked uh, who conducted the electoral uh, processes in Venezuela, if there was an independent authority, but then he also said that the question was answered during the presentation. Someone else asked uh, in the art about the Article 62 of the Constitution, if it is possible to register a political organization and what, what are the steps to be followed to do so. We also received some greetings from the audience through the chat box and the participants who are following us uh, via Zoom. Well, it looks like we don't have uh, any more questions. This was a video made possible uh, by the friends of Alba TV. Of course, the director is pretty busy because we are two weeks from uh, the elections and we are very grateful to her because she uh, explained everything to us. We have Aiskin Gel, who is uh, standing ready to answer the questions, which should you have questions. We also received greetings from Brazil, from the Brazilian Association for Jurists in Favor of Democracy. Well, very well then. So, so far the only question was the question on the possibility of registering political organizations in Venezuela and the steps to be concluded in order to register those uh, political organizations. But before I give the floor to our partner here in Venezuela, I would like to, Jade to ask her if she has questions. Jade, do you have questions from your side? Yes. Um... The, the first one is about the uh, in, indigenous um, questions because um, as far as we know, uh, on 6th of December, indigenous people have their own election. So uh, we wonder whether they can uh, claim their rights to the uh, homeland, particularly from any uh, land law, because now they have political rights. But how about their claim to the, uh, their homeland? And the second question is about the um, the uh, the mass mobilization. Uh, to what extent they think that uh, there will be a, a high degree of mass mobilization? Um, how it compare with the uh, Bolivia? Because um, the uh, the left the leftists uh, is uh, in power again. So how it compare with Bolivia's situation? And the uh, and the, the one uh, question from the chat room is about the uh, any uh, criminal has any uh, the right of vote. Yeah, that's free question. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. Let me verify if uh, there are other questions in the chat. 
Well, I will give the floor to Aisken for her to answer the questions. Oh yes, we also have Tanya who is connected very well. Maybe she could answer the questions if, uh, if it's, it's necessary. I will give the floor first to Aisko and then Tanya, she can also participate if she wants to complete some of the comments made by Aisko. Aisko, you have the floor. Well, uh, allow me to seize the opportunity to answer the question on the organization of the political parties. How do they organize their actions? It, they, we have approved regulations on political parties where we establish a timetable for the political parties to register their candidacies in the National Electoral Council. And from there on, we start a proceeding. They collect the necessary signatures, 0 0.5 of the registry of the electoral roll in at least 12 states. And after they have collected all the signatures and that they have been registered in the CNE, we start a process for the verification with the automated verification system of voters. So we validate their digital prints and then we summon a percentage of those voters who are actually militants of that political party in order for them to be recognized as a political body participating in the elections. We do this at a national wide and regional wide. However, in the electoral processes, we also have the possibility for individuals to participate if some, someone wants to participate in an election, this person can uh, make a request to the National Electoral Council. The person needs to gather uh, some, uh, to, to, fulf to fill full some conditions and uh, it can be accepted. This happened in the last, in the last election, presidential election. Someone wanted to nominate himself he did not belong to a political party, but you can also do it through a mechanism that we call group of electors. The group of electors do the following. They ask for a name to be assigned to their group and they gather different, they follow different steps in their states. And once they have been approved by the National Electoral Council, they can participate in the elections. This is what happened in the presidential elections. We had a candidate named Bertucci. He was a candidate that ran for elections in the presidential elections. He presented a number of voters. And uh, since these voters reached more than 1%, he could create his own political party because our law enables for the creation of group of electors. And if those group of electors are present, present their requirement to the CNE, they can become a political party. So they can participate. The indigenous Per organizations participate as indigenous organizations. In other words, they bring their uh, charters, 
they explain what their organizations are about and these organizations are approved by the National Electoral Council and can participate in the elections and the polls. We would like to seize the opportunity to greet all of those who follow us from different countries, from India, from South Africa, from Canada, from the United States, Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, and from China, we have uh, been followed by 1,756 participants. So there are three questions that have been um, asked from China. They want to know what are the mechanisms to guarantee the participation of the indigenous populations in the forthcoming elections? And uh, how do they organize themselves? How do they organize their elections in the indigenous populations? And there is a second question that you can maybe comment a little bit on in the Q&A or in the analysis part of our seminar today is, what about the mobilization of the masses for the upcoming elections? They also asked, what can you tell us about uh, what is happening or what happened in Bolivia and how can you compare the Bolivian experience with the Venezuelan experience? And a third question has to do with electoral rights. So what are the mechanisms provided that are established in the CNE in order to guarantee the, elect, the voting rights to all the Venezuelan population. Well, let's start with uh, the indigenous population question. First, I would like to say that uh, in on December the 9th, we will have the election for the indigenous populations. On the 6th, we will run the elections for the majority of the population, but on the 9th, we will conduct elections for the indigenous peoples. And they are going to vote through general assemblies. We have a timetable. This timetable time is available in our website. And according to the timetable, you will see what are the different activities they will conduct. First of all, they previously conducted general assemblies and indigenous populations in 10 states. In Venezuela, in our constitution, we include the participation of the indigenous peoples. It is enshrined in our constitution. So they have already conducted community assemblies. Those community assemblies have already been identified and included in the timetable the Statistic National Institute in Venezuela and the Ministry of the Indigenous Peoples have already identified those communities. So what did we do? We asked for the information on those indigenous populations and with the different authorities of the CNE offices in the different states, we conducted several coordinating meetings. And what did we do? We went out to those communities. We visited them according to the timetable that they had established for their assemblies. And we then met with them during those community assemblies. And of course, in those community assemblies, there were spokespersons who were appointed. And what was the function of those spokespersons? 
12. Because many people don't understand why the elections is going to be are going to be held on the ninth for the for the Aboriginal peoples, and it is going to be on the ninth because they are going to vote through a manual process. This was the way in which we we thought it was best suited for them to vote. Why? Because we had to com we have to compile information from the spokespersons in our electoral role. We have not the full identification of all indigenous populations. So in order to abide by the constitution, which is that indigenous needs to vote for indigenous candidates, what did we do? Well, once we once we attended this assemblies, we were informed on the spokespersons who had been nominated, who have been elected, because they know their own leaders. They know who can represent them as a spokesperson that can then elect a deputy, the deputies. So this is how it all took place. What has happened so far, and I'd like to explain this to you, when in the last elections in 2015 in the Amazonas state, according to the electoral roll, everyone voted, but uh, one, the so to speak, white representative and not the indigenous representative. So the indigenous populations were not voting for other indigenous candidates, but the rest of the persons that are registered or were registered in that electoral role were the ones deciding who the representative of that estate was going to be. So we thought that the indigenous needed to elect the indigenous representative because they know who their leaders are and they need to vote for some of their own. And this is important and this is why it is inscribed in our regulations. A indigenous representative needs to speak the indigenous language because you cannot have a representative who does not know how to speak the indigenous language. So it is mandatory to have one representative from the community, from the Aboriginal community, from a representative from the spokesperson who's going to choose the deputy. And he needs also to speak the language and he needs to be recognized by the community. So this is why during all, the whole process, 3,558 spokespersons were elected in the indigenous populations and comprising the candidates that are going to participate in the process. This has been a proposal made by the indigenous peoples and they are recognized by the CNE to nominate their own candidates. On December the 9th, through a secret ballot in a ballot box, they are going to elect their candidates. All this information is available in our website you can see the indigenous ballot and uh, on that ballot you will have the name and the surname and the organization nominating the candidates so in the general assemblies the spokespersons those 3558 spokespersons in the different 10 regions they are going to cast their ballots in the ballot box and then of course we will have the tally process to know who the winner is this is what is going to happen on december the 9th regarding the indigenous elections and i would like also to say that 
When I was explaining in my presentation on the 6th, I also said that indigenous were going to vote, indigenous population, why? Because in our electoral role, we do not make a difference between the indigenous populations and uh, the other populations. So if someone is going to vote for, if they want to vote for a candidate to the National Assembly, they can do it. On the 6th, we are, on the 9th, only the indigenous populations are going to vote for their deputies to the National Assembly through the 3,500 spokespersons. Maybe the explanation was too detailed. I apologize if it was too long in my answer. Regarding the electoral rights, we have been working to guarantee transparency of our electoral processes, reliability of our process, the trust that our, our people places in our electoral process. And that trust can, as patent is evident, when more than 170 political parties are participating. And then when we have more than 14,000 candidates who trust the electoral branch and participate in the elections. First, we guarantee the participation of uh, political organizations. Not only can they nominate their candidates, but they can also participate in all the auditing processes that has 16 different audits. And you can have access to this information through our website. There you can see all the organizations participate in all the audits. And we also guarantee We also guarantee the participation of the electoral workers who are chosen randomly from the electoral roll, with the exception of uh, people over 70 years old or having some kind of disability, or if the person cannot, for work reasons, accept to be an electoral worker. The political organizations can be sure of the transparency of the whole process because the electoral workers are selected randomly. And we also give them the possibility to nominate or to propose their observers. It is different from the witnesses of the poll station. The witnesses are proposed by the political, over, observe, uh, political organizations to observe the process, to be present, to validate the polls, and they are present in the polling stations since the opening of the, of the polling stations until the ballots are over. This guarantee the political organizations that they are going to have a person from their political party who is following the election and guaranteeing the transparency of the whole process. We have also given the opportunity to the organizations, the political organizations, to display their propaganda or to display their publicity in a website created by the National Electoral Council so that the council can also assist the parties in the dissemination of their campaigns. We have held various meetings with the political organizations and the mass media so that they can have access to this uh, 
a political campaign and publicity. We also guarantee them, uh, guarantee the rights of the disabled so that they can vote being accompanied by a member of their family or someone that will assist them in the voting process that sometimes are located within the polling stations. So this is how we also guarantee the vote for the disabled. If someone requires help or assistance to vote, that person can, uh, can be accompanied by someone of their family or some other person. And we also guarantee that the, all the electoral material is going to be safely kept In Caracas, we prepare our machines. We also make audits of the lists and uh, all Venezuelans can exercise their right, provided that they are registered in the electoral roll. And we have also had special days in which we intensify the registry process. But Venezuelans can register themselves every day, seven, seven, seven. They can register themselves every day and can even change the electoral, uh, the polling station if they want, if they moved from the, their residence. And we also had a special activities to update the data of uh, people having moved from one place to another and having moved from polling stations. So I explain all this to you to tell you that we are guaranteeing the vote to our voters. We have a system based on one vote, one voter. And all voters are required to uh, put their digital print in the device and the machine in order to activate the machine vote. In the case of the disabled, people who do not have hands, there is a special provision for them. The president of the polling station is the only person who can activate, activate the machine because the person is missing a limb missing the higher limbs and of course does not have a digital print but uh, there is a special room where this is being done with the presence of the disabled person someone who is missing their hands for instance So, in the case of the disabled, we also guarantee their right to vote, as we guarantee the right to vote to all Venezuelans who are registered in the electoral roll. We have enlarged also the number of polling stations. In the past, we did not have so many electoral polling centers, but today, all voters can show up to their respective polling station and cast their vote. Thank you very much. One question. Considering that part of the position want to boycott the elections, what do you expect to have as a turnout in this election and what turnout could be a positive turnout for these elections? Well, we have conducted two drills in this electoral process and we have been witnesses of the high turnout of electors and voters that have come to the drills to practice with their, with their machines. And voters have approached us to see how everything works, to practice with the machines, 
So a very important number of people have participated in this drill. So uh, this enabled us, enabled us to me to say that the political organizations are going to participate, the number of political organizations, and uh, during the drills is the number of uh, voters who have come to practice with the machines is important. So this uh, tells me that we are going to have a very high turnout of Venezuelans that are ready to cast their vote and exercise their right. Thank you very much for your explanation and thank you for the opportunity of uh, sharing with us the insights on the electoral branch of Venezuela. Thank you very much. Well, to start the closing phase of this meeting, as I said at the beginning, the purpose of this meeting was to listen to the presentation of uh, one of the directors of the CNE in order to have the institutional perspective this perspective of an impartial institution on the electoral system. And now in closing, we would like to proceed to a different, completely different uh, phase from a, a political perspective from the different, from the Simon Bolivar Institution and Alba Movimientos platform and to discuss what is at stake and the upcoming elections. So I will give the floor to Carlos Ron, president of the Simon Bolivar Institute, so he will make some comments on that. Carlos, are you connected? Thank you. It is a great pleasure to be with you. From our perspective as an institute, these elections are crucial, not only because we are going to elect a new national assembly and because of uh, the political dispute in Venezuela, but also because this has geopolitical importance when Venezuelans are going to vote on December the 6th. We are also voting to make sure that uh, internationally our right to participate is recognized because over the last months there have been a, a relentless campaign mainly by the US government saying that these are no legitimate elections, that they should not uh, take place. So the world should know that in Venezuela, we are defending the right uh, to do what is enshrined in the constitution, namely that we should have elections this year. And at the beginning of next year, 2021, we should activate a new national assembly. This is important because the strategy used against Venezuela to weaken the political process in this country is precisely to ignore its institutions, the political spaces, the political movements that exist in the country, to ignore the president and to disregard the role of a political sector through this idea that there is an alternative government, a parallel government, which are totally illegal and outside the constitution, but they want to preserve that idea in order to 
uh, disregard the constituent uh, political bodies in Venezuela. To take out to the streets to vote, the very fact that the elections take place is a clear demonstration of our uh, vibrant democracy. The extreme political parties with direct links with the US administration that uh, persist in subversion and anti-constitutional methods. Well, in the very transitional tool document where they justify that uh, Mr. Guaido should be the interim president. In that very document, they recognize that the mandate Mr. Guaido has as a deputy, as a lawmaker, finishes on January 2021. So they are mindful that once these elections takes place, there will be no further mandate by this uh, political platform that they have uh, created in order to attack the institutions of the country. Therefore, these elections should be viewed within this geopolitical perspective because uh, the Trump administration, we don't know what is going to happen with the Biden's administration, but Trump has this has decided not to recognize this government and the institutions, and they have attempted by all means to prevent these elections. So we need to understand that these elections are a very excellent tool for Venezuela to make sure that the opposition channel the political differences through democratic processes and not through the adventure they have been promoting since 2019 uh, with the creation of the parallel government. Therefore, it is very important to ensure a strong uh, participation of the opposition because uh, an important sector of the opposition is present in the elections. They have presented the candidate as the director of the, the council set, more than uh, 98 political opposition parties participating. So this dismantled the narrative fostered by the US media and European media that uh, in these elections, uh, there's no participation of the opposition. That is not true. There are parties of the opposition participating, but parties against our uh, government, uh, the social democracy, Christian democracy. We have the whole bunch of ideological positions, the whole rainbow of, of, of opposition. There are a number of proposals made by those candidates. And, uh, and they have always been considered opposition party. What is the difference? Well, most of them have decided not to support those who advocate illegal processes to gain power, contrary to the opposition, but rather to channel the discontent and the differences they have with the government through electoral channels to elect the new assembly. Because a country that has been targeted of a blockade, unilateral coercive measures, has suffered attempt of assassination of the president of the republic, invasion attempt, as we saw in May last, by mercenaries and so on and so forth. The way to do politics when you have differences, that should be done through democratic channels. So these opposition willing to participate, they're going to channel their disagreement with the government through elections in order to elect a new national assembly. In this fashion, they, they, they remove all support to those who have uh, advocated uh, illegal means to uh, change government. And they are promoting the US administration uh, interest. It's been demonstrated election after elections that uh, 
a neoliberal uh, platform calling for the dismantling of social programs, calling for privatization, calling for um, all the type of uh, non-inclusive policies, they are rejected by the population. So they have they realized that, that through democracy, that type of platform cannot be elected. Therefore, they resort to aggressions, to adventures. They try to find a, a military to betray uh, their allegiance to the constitution in order to impose a, a dictatorship. They call for foreign invasion and so forth, and so, and so forth, and so, and so forth. The current National Assembly that's been led by these minority opposition uh, leaders. I say minority because even the grassroots of those countries, of those parties, they want to participate. Well, these sectors have, pro, have uh, used the National Assembly as a platform to go abroad to ask uh, coercive measures against Venezuela, to ask uh, uh, the blockade of our assets to prevent the use of our funds abroad, the access to resources, our companies such as Citgo in the US. They have used the National Assembly to appoint parallel organs, such as a parallel judiciary and so on and so forth which are powerless, they have no power, but they have uh, attempted to create this fiction in order to use what is called the law fair, to law, use law fair to foment regime change, even though the president has been democratically elected by the people. So, the National Assembly, that tool that they have used, well, it's over for them. Now we can have a new assembly truly channeling the political um, strife but through democratic means. So this election, is as important for the country as the fact that the countries in the world recognize this legitimate process. Those who are truly interested for dialogue and peace, they should support these elections because it is through democracy that we will be able to preserve peace in the country so we can settle our differences. The other choice is to continue with the policy advocated by the US, namely to go through swift solutions, non-constitutional solutions, ignoring a large part of the population. The very same political group that is attempting to create a parallel government, that very political group, they wanted to dismantle the, the housing mission, which is uh, a centerpiece of our policies. Three million housing units have been built. Well, three million housing units were built to help the people, so low-income people that have access to their own home. Well, these people promoted from the National Assembly the privatization of these housing units. Therefore, from the very outset, not only they advocate and non-constitutional means, but also the dismantling of the state, the loss of our resources abroad. This is very serious. 
because then we are prevented from uh, having access to resources which are of the essence in order for the state to import food, medicine, strategic material. For agricultural production, spare parts, gasolines to ensure transport, etc., and to meet our basic needs. These elections, therefore, is crucial, not only because of the coming changes, and there are proposals from the progressive and revolutionary sector, there are interesting proposals of new laws to strengthen the people's power, communal cities, communal parliaments. These are some of the proposals launched during this campaign. And other laws regarding uh, environment, protection of, child, of uh, children and families, right to recreation, economic rights. The uh, digital currencies stemming from the blockade. So we aspire that uh, we're going to have a broad participation we are convinced that democracy is the path. Traditionally, legislative elections are not very popular. The turnout is not too big. However, people are enthusiastic to participate. We want to foster the participation of all sectors, but uh, that all problems should be settled through these uh, democratic means. So that's it, in case you wish me to answer questions. Yes, I have a question here. Perhaps this question was better answered, could have been better answered by the Electoral Council, but as Vice Minister of the Foreign Ministry, you might have some data. People are asking, about the participation of observers, foreign observers. Are, you, are we going to have foreign observers? Despite, uh, if despite the pandemic, are we going to have some foreign delegations accompanying us during the legislative elections? Well, the National Electoral Council and the Simon Bolivar Institute. We are going to have a group of people to accompany the elections. We have international overseers. They are experts in electoral matters, technical experts, jurists, academics versed in electoral matters and they will be attending. Our institute has invited uh, some observers who are interested in taking part um, in this process and see for themselves how it goes. We are respecting biosecurity measures implemented by the Electoral Council. We are very strict with biosecurity and we are being in contact with the PAHO to assist us in this area. Therefore, there will be no risk either for the population or the, the observers. So this 
process can be smooth. It is not the first electoral process being, in, being, being called for in the world. Recently, we had the US elections, but other countries have uh, been able to hold their elections with all safety. We have been learning from those experiences to see what have been uh, the, the weaknesses, the strengths of those uh, electoral processes. So our electoral council can take the best decisions regarding protection of the people against the pandemic. Very well, thank you very much, Carlos. Let's check if we have other questions. The Pan-African movements will be key for the, the legitimation of the elections. Do you have uh, uh, any link with this Pan-African organization so they can work with us? Well, we have a close relation with uh, several African nations and movements within the framework of the Pan-Africanism movement. As an institute of peace and solidarity, it's always important to engage with all the currents, vindicating dignity, unity of the peoples. It is therefore very important that we preserve these uh, relations with the Pan-African uh, movement uh, in its various manifestations, both in Africa and in the diaspora, in the Caribbean, in Europe, in the US and elsewhere. This electoral process is a call upon all the consciousness of all the groups fighting colonialism and in favor of the self-determination of the peoples, regardless of the main struggle, because uh, the right of the Venezuelan people to conduct this election should be recognized. I insist on this because from the US, um, in collusion with those serving its interests and the corporate transnational forces, they have tried to, pre to prevent this election. They have pressed uh, the European Union to prevent it from participating in the elections. They are the claimed lack of conditions. Now, you've seen, you've heard the director of uh, the, the CNE regarding the conditions, and then you see there is no reason whatsoever to question these elections. Now, what is the purpose of this critique? Well, the, they are trying to foster an interventionist uh, process in the case of uh, our elections. It's like what happened in the previous elections in Bolivia by the OAS, where the presence of the OAS resulted, resulted in the questioning of the, the results and also in the fostering of the coup d'etat in Bolivia. Was, that's what they uh, did. Our sovereignty cannot be subjected to this type of international organs. Those who favor self-determination should uh, support Venezuela. They should uh, respect our decision to conduct these elections in peace and should uh, accept the outcome and insist on this. The outcome is not going to favor necessarily the revolutionary forces and the Maduro party, no. The idea is the elections are conducted where all forces participate and the outcome will be the outcome people want. We are not defending a political persuasion. We are defending the right of Venezuelans to decide in peace, democratically, without foreign interventions, sanctions and attacks and decide what is 
going to be the future of the country within the constitutional and uh, legal framework. And people should understand that whoever wins, no matter who's going to win, it is possible that conservative and right-wing parties are going to have a space in the National Assembly. That is good, no problem. As long as it's, as it's the will of the people, democracy is precisely that, that people decide their fate. Thank you very much. 1,500 people are, are being following us to China and 50 people through Zoom. I'm going to make my final comments to conclude this session. This session has been very important. So we have been able to see the, the journey prior to this election and how the electoral branch has been a tool of the struggle of the Venezuelan people during the last of 20 years. It's been a part of the legacy and the heritage. And um, we've been wondering what is at stake of these elections? Well, it's important to say, as in prior elections, what is at stake is the possibility of the continuity of the Bolivarian Revolution. And as Carlos said, there are some other elements that contrary to prior elections, here it is not, what it has take is not if Chavismo win, if uh, the revolution wins or not, no. What is at stake here is the very possibility in dismantling the Period blockade. This assembly, in this assembly, we we're going to have opposition parties, Chavismo parties, and also parties that even in the left field, they critique the government. But what is common in this case is the need to lift the blockade, to demand the lifting of the blockade. So the legislative elect, uh, assembly, there will be election, is going to be a national assembly that is going to advocate for the lifting of the blockade, even though its members have ideological differences in favor or against socialism or uh, with critics against uh, the administration, etc. What is of the essence is the demand to lift the blockade and to go back to politics we need to go back to politics the internal political debate we need to preserve that and the second aspect has to do with those who have advocated uh, the anti-political process those who have fostered international intervention and interim government unilateral coercive measures against the country. And those who have uh, proposed these measures that have uh, stifled the material life of the Bolivarian Republic. So we have countries, or that we have parties that no longer participate in the political process and they are abroad deploying in other countries, demanding more coercive measures and more blockade and supporting Washington in pursuing the blockade against Venezuela and the pressures in order to stifle and uh, um, provoke a regime change in Venezuela. So, In the case of the activists, academics, scholars following this seminar, there are three keys, three key elements that uh, we wish you to foster. First, to have a common, common cause to lift the blockade. This is, uh, is key. There is no legal or human reason to support this blockade against Venezuela. This is uh, bullying, this is harassment to destroy the democratic framework in Venezuela. 
and this democratic uh, framework has been clearly described during these eight sessions. Especially today, where we have uh, spelled out the electoral process in Venezuela. The second uh, things we ask international community is to um, demand the recognition of the outcome of these elections. As uh, Mrs. D'Amelio said, the Venezuelan electoral system fully guarantees the right of the majority of uh, the country. An automated system, fully auditable, verifiable, reliable, and in the coming days, will make it possible for foreign uh, observers coming here, they can uh, see for themselves how transparent this electoral system is. So we call upon the government of the world, the multilateral bodies, to recognize the outcome of these elections. This is of the essence. And uh, we request not only our allied left-wing organizations, but also center and left organizations that they ask, they demand, or the, the US and any other political organization calling for the non-recognition of these elections and favoring blockade that call them to respect national sovereignty. Those who are favoring intervention in Venezuela, we need to call upon them to go back to politics, to go back to the political means to deal with our differences. We need to call upon those who are abroad that come to Venezuela to settle this uh, uh, conflict through diplomatic, uh, through democratic means. If they refuse to do so, they are then outside the political uh, game. The dispute that we have in Venezuela, the challenge that we have ahead of us is to fight the blockade because we do not think uh, the US will decide to lift uh, the blockade. So the blockade will remain their strategy. And the Venezuelan people and our brothers and sisters, we need you to get united to resist and de denounce the blockade and move forward in order to build an alternative to colonial venture capitalism imposed upon us over the last years. So this is our request and uh, our challenge is to how to build an alternative uh, uh, system, alternative to the rentier and uh, uh, capitalist model. So with these closing remarks, we then uh, bid goodbye. Thank you very much for attending. We invite you to uh, the coming session, the penultimate of this year, focused on the people's economies in the covered factories under the workers' control, peasants, urban companies, alternative networks, and uh, the training processes to improve uh, agroecological production the construction of uh, production, and we're going to talk to activists and experts in the popular um, production. So again, thank you so much to Dania, Dania Melio, uh, Carlos, to, to Carlos Ron, president of Simon Bolivar Institute. Thank you very much, and we will overcome. <laughs>